Hello, and welcome to the next installment of our Autumn 2020 Food System Seminar Series, Growing Resilience and Equity, Food Systems Amidst the Dual Pandemics of COVID and Systemic Racism. My name is Yona Sipos, and I am so happy to be back here with you all. Before I introduce our excellent speaker for today, I have several announcements to share as usual. As we've been doing each week of the seminar, we'll begin with an Indigenous land acknowledgement to recognize and speak aloud that Seattle, on which many of us are at the University of Washington, many of us are learning and working, that Seattle is on traditional, ancestral, and unceded Coast Salish territory. Specifically, the Duwamish, Muckleshoot, Tulalip, and Suquamish tribes and nations who are still here. This week, I am also adding a labor acknowledgement to center and lift up the too often invisible work of Indigenous, African American, and Black, Asian, and Latinx communities. These communities' labor and stewardship through slavery, unpaid and underpaid labor, has and continues to build up the wealth and prosperity of this land, including for uninvited settlers. A land and labor acknowledgement is a formal statement that pays tribute to the original inhabitants of the land and the many years of labor and stewardship that went into the space. I recently just learned about doing labor acknowledgements, which is why I'm bringing this in today. And it feels also like a particularly relevant theme for both last week's seminar and the one that we're about to experience. So by the time you will see this, it either will be election day or it will have just passed. And I know that you are all aware that it has been election season. This has been felt for me like a very long election season. One piece of good news that I'd like to lift up a little bit is that youth turnout in this election has been surging. So way to go, youth, in the seminar. I encourage you to continue to stay involved as results come in and as we move into the next stage of American politics. Of course, this political season, this election season has not been without stress. And uh, one of the many factors that go into coping with uncertainty um, is, is resilience. And resilience, as we are exploring through the seminar, is really about system conditions that allow for recovery after disruptions and shocks. A component of resilience is, um, is, is some of the resources here, is seeking out resources, knowing that there are resources available to support you and knowing where to find them. So just a few that are listed here include the UW Counseling Center line. Uh, one of the phone numbers that's listed here is 24 hours or after hours. Um, we also have an ongoing election stress meditation, daily meditation that is happening for the rest of this week. And uh, in a couple of weeks, there will be a UW Wellness Week sharing more resources and opportunities to connect and build community. As always, during this time especially, please continue to take care of yourselves and each other. And you can always reach out to Dorothy and I, especially over Canvas, um, as things come up for you. As you know, there is no reflection due this week. Instead, I want to encourage you to please use this extra time to take the lessons from today's seminar and include them in your broader reflections about the state of the US, the results of the election, and particularly as they intersect with food systems. And uh, that is actually the topic for today. So we will be learning about why voting matters to food systems. And with that, I am so pleased to introduce the speaker for today, the director of Heal Food Alliance, Navina Khanna. Navina has dedicated over 15 years to, sell it, to creating a more just and sustainable world through transforming food systems. Navina's work has been recognized uh, in 2014 with a James Beard Leadership Award. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was very excited to learn with a Jean Mayer Prize for Excellence in Nutrition Science and Policy. Navina has a background in sustainable agriculture and food justice and serves on um, the Board of Richmond's Urban Tilth, advises the Real, media, Real Food Media Project and organizes with Asians for Black Lives. Navina is a first-generation South Asian American with a worldview shaped by growing up 
and growing food in both India and the United States. Thank you so much for making time to speak with our class today, Navina, and welcome. I'm going to stop sharing and turn this over to you. Thanks so much for having me, Yona, and I'm really glad to be here with you and your students. And I, and I hope that um, election day hasn't passed yet because it's such a critical election as we'll be talking about. Um, it matters so much for the shape of our food and agricultural systems here in the US and of course around the world. So let me just pull up my slides to start sharing. Um, one day this will happen smoothly. Okay, great. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm the director of the HEAL Food Alliance. HEAL stands for Health, Environment, Agriculture, and Labor. And uh, we are a multi-sector, multi-racial national alliance of organizations around the country that are growing to working together to grow our power um, so that we can shift systems. And one of the things that we're all very aware of right now in this moment is how critical this particular election is. Um, as folks know, this is one of the most contested elections that any of us have um, been a part of. It's one of the most critical elections, too. Um, and it's critical for a couple of key reasons, right? One of them, um, folks have probably seen some version of this before, but one of them, of course, is that we are without a doubt facing uh, extreme climate chaos. And the decisions that get made uh, now around who is appointed to political office, who holds political office, who is sworn in, are the decisions around what kind of leadership we will have as we're addressing climate chaos. We're at the stage right now where we're no longer thinking just about whether we're going to get to 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2 degrees Celsius, um, but really thinking about how are we going to manage, how are we going to be resilient, how are we going to survive the, the ongoing crises of things like uh, climate chaos. And uh, we've already seen the impacts in communities around the country, um, not just this year, but in years past with floods happening in the Midwest and inland hurricanes like Hurricane Derecho coming in. And of course, wildfires that have been up and down the West Coast and moving inland um, in my home state of California where we saw over 800 wildfires. Uh, and of course, some up here in Washington as well. And with the ongoing climate chaos, the kinds of changes that we're seeing, um, we're also seeing a forced migration happening as a part of that. And as we'll talk about, many of the decisions that get made around who gets to live where and what kind of resources and services they have access to in the face of something like climate chaos and other crises um, are largely determined by the people who hold the most power. Um, those people who are appointed to political office or who are sworn in. Of course, the other backdrop that we're all operating within, and Yona, you already mentioned this, is of course uh, the coronavirus. And we're at a stage right now where we're adding almost 100,000 cases, probably increasing to over 100,000 cases a day. And um, we are, we, we know that what we need now is crisis proof food systems that can get us through things like COVID, that can get us through climate chaos. Um, and we need elected leaders who are gonna make decisions to make that for us. Um, we just can just look back at some of the headlines over the last seven months to see that there are so many ways that food and farm workers, farmers are being affected, of course, whole communities are being affected by um, the intersection of what's happening with our food and agriculture systems and the response uh, to a public health crisis like the coronavirus that's happening right now, whether that's in terms of um, hunger, or in terms of labor laws or whatever. And we'll talk more about those things too. And of course, there is one particular group of people and you uh, acknowledge this already, but um, food and farm workers you know, across the whole food chain are affected by all of these decisions. And particularly thinking about those who actually work in the fields, whether it's through fires or through rain or the floods or through the heat um, or through something like this pandemic that we're all experiencing now. Um, the, the work conditions don't change. Um, so making sure that folks have the protections that they need is something that we're thinking about when we think about this election. So how did we get here? How did we get to the US food system that we have today? And um, what are some of the decision points along the way that make this such an important election? This image that you see here, some folks might be familiar with, is uh, the image of 
a sankofa, which comes from a Khan from Ghana. And it's this idea that in order to understand how to move forward together, uh, we have to look back. And just to say that as we think about what it is to move forward together, I think we all know that we want our families, our communities, our loved ones to be safe. We know that we want to have resilient, not only food systems, but futures for all of us. Um, and that's what we're grounding into is how do we make that possible for all of us. But if we look back through time, thank you, Yona, again, for doing that land acknowledgement. I'm also right here in Washington state right now and looking at this entire land mass that is now the United States. There are indigenous groups that lived all over this, uh, this landmass and uh, many who persist today. But the first shaping that we saw of the kind of food system that we were gonna experience today came through the colonization of these lands, right? Through um, settlers coming to this country, committing mass genocide um, of people, stealing lands from people who had lived here for thousands of years. And what that meant in terms of the shaping of our US food system is that the, the dominant agricultural systems, the dominant systems of cultivation that folks had here, which were systems of reciprocity and respecting life and living in relationship with the land that they were on, um, were forcibly eradicated. Of course, there are some exceptions to that. There are folks in um, many indigenous nations around the country who have persisted and who still keep their traditional agricultural techniques alive and who keep that um, traditional ecological knowledge as part of how they cultivate, how they live, how they eat. Um, but the, the force of colonization really tried to wipe out that, what had been the dominant cultivation system. So that's what we first saw here. And this system of um, eradicating a culture of reciprocity, eradicating a culture that held life as sacred um, was, was upheld, right? It was upheld over the next couple hundred years as we saw uh, the desire to grow more and more off of the extraction and exploitation of peoples. And this is one map that shows how, you know, goods were traded, um, but of course it also shows the route that people were kidnapped and um, brought over to this landmass, to what became the US um, and enslaved. And enslaved for the purpose of growing things like sugar and molasses and cotton and tobacco and the things that would make um, the, the British empire able to succeed. So basically over those first couple hundred years, we were defining the food system of the US as one that was based on extraction based on exploitation um, of whole peoples and of the land. Uh, and that system is calcified today, right? So if we look at what happened over history and how that's affected uh, the politics and voting, um, we, can, we can just look to the last couple hundred years to see a few examples, right? So in 1830, just less than 200 years ago, was the Indian Removal Act that forcibly moved folks from the lands that they were on and resettled them to elsewhere. In 1862, um, we saw the Homestead Act, right? The Homestead Act is what gave um, white families who were willing to move further west uh, 160 acres so that they could start setting up their own farms. Um, and of course, we know who this land came from and it was given to these families. So that's, that's who now <laughs> it's reflected in who owns land and who works it today. Um, just a few years later was the 13th Amendment, which was passed, um, and that was the amendment that was passed to emancipate folks from slavery, people who had been enslaved. Um, of course, there are many problems with the 13th Amendment in that it allows people who um, are incarcerated to keep working for free or for very low wages. Um, and so we see this exploitation and this extraction falling along color-coded racialized lines throughout history and today. Um, just again, starting to go through, it wasn't until 1887 when those folks who had been the ones cultivating this land um, were granted the right to vote in this country. And that right to vote only came if they were willing to disassociate from the, their tribe. It was another 20 years or so before uh, indigenous people to this land even had the opportunity to get citizenship here to give them the right to vote um, as themselves. 
um, just one more policy that, that really defines who gets to make decisions, who gets to vote, what that looks like, um, is 1938, the Fair Labor Standards Act that was passed. And that act, when it was passed, um, excluded farm workers, it included, excluded domestic workers, it excluded a majority of the kinds of jobs that folks who had been enslaved were doing. Um, it excluded them from having the same kinds of protections and rights as other work working people here in the US. And what that act has done in many ways is create a permanent class of folks who are working in the food system. The majority of folks who are working in the food system are from immigrant families. Um, and the, the, the vast majority of folks who work on farms are. So now we get immigration policies and attempts at immigration policies that really try to regulate who works on farms and keep that to guest workers who have no right to make decisions, no right to vote, no right to any of the, the, the resources um, that the rest of working people here in the US get access to. Uh, and of course, it wasn't then for almost 30 more years that the Voting Rights Act was passed that um, gave black folks the right to vote here in this country. And we're still seeing many repercussions of that today um, in who holds power, who makes decisions, and what that looks like. And of course, all of this is within an ongoing context, right, of mass incarceration, as we touched on a little bit already, in the ongoing context of racial profiling, as we're seeing, um, we have seen since the <laughs> beginning of the 20th century and we're still seeing today show up in so many different ways in terms of um, what happens to whom. Um, sorry. One. Okay, so after our technical difficulties, which hopefully we'll be okay on, um, this is our glimpse of some of the major decisions that got made over the course of just a little over a hundred years um, that really determined who gets to uh, decide uh, who holds political office and who is appointed to it. And of course, there are many ongoing uh, phenomena that make a difference as well, right? Mass incarceration, which we already talked about, racial profiling, ongoing voter suppression, which we're seeing in many different uh, ways coming up during this election as well. Um, money and politics, so the number of corporations that are actually the ones that are writing the rules around what kinds of laws and regulations they have, what governs them. Um, corporate control of our food system, which we'll talk just a little bit more about in just in a moment. Um, and of course, the ongoing extraction and exploitation of land and labor and life, as we've already talked about. Um, just looking back at this last election that we had, after we've talked through who has access to what kind of decision making um, and what kind of access folks have had historically, uh, just looking at the 2018 midterms, if, for example, only men voted, the outcome would have looked really, really different. Um, this is based on polling patterns in different districts around the country, the 2018 uh, congressional race. If only people of color voted in the 2018 midterms, um, this is also what it would look like. So when we think about who has access to voting and the kinds of votes that are being suppressed and the kinds of decisions that have been made over the last 150 years, really the last 500 years, but particularly in calcifying law over the last 150 years, who has access to what kinds of decisions. Um, this is what it looks like. This is the difference between um, whose votes get counted. So what kinds of decisions are up, <clears throat> right? When we look at our federal elections, um, there's everything from appointments to different departments, whether that's the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Labor, Department of Justice, Health and Human Services, the United States Department of Agriculture. There's so many bodies that regulate what happens with our food and agriculture system. And it's the administration that makes the decision as to who is going to run each of those departments. The different committees that regulate food and agriculture. So whether that's... Um, the agricultural committees, whether that's uh, various climate committees and things like that, there are um, a certain number of senators and 
congressional members who serve on each of those committees. And in the case of a massive piece of legislation like the Farm Bill that has so much impact on um, our food and agriculture system today, it's those folks who are really drafting up what the Farm Bill looks like and what kinds of decisions we're making around that. Executive orders, we've seen so many come through in the last few years um, that determine how people <clears throat> are able to respond to the crisis in their communities um, and what kinds of laws govern things. <clears throat> and um, of course, whoever is president <laughs> is the one who makes these kind of executive orders. And of course, there are a number of different issues that come up that have come up in these debates around this election and that come up all the time on a federal level in terms of immigration, who has access to what kinds of services, um, who has access to even being on this land, healthcare. Why, why does healthcare matter for food and agriculture systems? Well, one really big reason why it matters is because um, in many rural communities where so many people are actually leaving their farms uh, because they can no longer make a living on their farms, um, they don't have many of the basic support systems in place, like having access to hospitals and, and paid health care and things like that that would make it possible for them to stay on their land and to thrive. Um, of course, around climate, we saw, um, we've seen a, a vast difference between how different candidates are responding to the climate crisis at hand. Um, things like food assistance programs, so who gets access to SNAP benefits, whether people get access to SNAP benefits and EBT, um, how much money schools get reimbursed for meals that they provide to students, things like crop insurance and more. Um, disaster insurance, whether farm workers are also compensated like farmers are when there are disasters like the, the floods and wildfires and things like that that we've talked about already. Uh, it's so obviously not just on a federal level that decisions are getting made. There are things that happen on state and local levels as well um, in terms of our emergency response when there are wildfires, when there is a pandemic, um, the decisions that get made. Um, things like climate action plans can get decided on a very local level. My city of Oakland just passed uh, the most comprehensive climate action plan that exists in the country, which I'm really excited about. And it's the first one that includes food and agriculture as part of the climate action plan. Um, that's because of our local city council. It's also our local elected officials and appointed officials, um, local and state that set the budget priorities of what's actually gonna matter for our communities who make land use decisions around what gets developed on, um, what gets relegated for things like urban agriculture, um, whether or not to comply with some of the federal rules that may or may not work for our communities. Things like whether, um, folks who are arrested in a particular city or county or state get turned over to ICE, to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, whether um, folks of any gender or sexual orientation are able to marry each other, things like that. Um, those are decisions that get made depending on the jurisdiction that you're in, sanctuary cities. Um, and of course, things like school meals decided by the school board, whether uh, we have access to composting in our cities, all kinds of decisions that affect our everyday lives get made by the people who are in office, whether it's school board, city council, um, state office, and more. <clears throat> the, the food system that we have today, of course, is hugely impacted by that corporate control that we already talked about, right? So for companies that control 86% of the beef market, and we can see that reflected in meat, uh, in every sector of meat. Um, we see these massive junk food companies that have a huge lobby. They're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on marketing and on influencing the rules around their marketing. Uh, and of course, um, big food, that is writing the rules around how much percent of ownership they can have over any part of the system and what kinds of decisions all of us get to make at the grocery store. <clears throat> we see that across the board. <clears throat> Sorry. So what does that mean over the last four years? Um, well, just to look back at the very beginning of this administration, we saw on day one that uh, the, the president nominated Andrew Puzder to be the head of the Department of Labor. Um, Andrew Puzder is somebody with a, a terrible record on labor. Um, who has never supported workers. Folks across the country, unions and other organizers fought back and we managed to make it so that Andrew Puster did not get that appointment. But that on day one was an indication of what this administration would look like for our food and agriculture system. Within that first week, we saw um, 
the, the Muslim ban go into effect, which thinking about a food and agriculture system beyond any kind of humanity or anything, a huge percentage of grocery stores, um, sorry, corner stores in cities around the country, the vast majority of them are owned by Yemeni people. So thinking about the family members of folks who are um, impacted by something like a Muslim ban affects, of course, our food system and what we have access to. Um, things like the Paris Accord and pulling out of that, uh, the kinds of climate agreements that this administration was going to participate in. We saw all of that happen within just the first few days. And over time with this administration, we've seen all kinds of rollbacks and cuts for people and the planet. We've seen um, almost 100 environmental regulations rolled back. We've seen um, SNAP benefits have to be fought for time and time again. We've seen all kinds of rollbacks for our communities. Um, We've seen how that showed up with environmental regulations or the lack thereof. Um, and of course, the impacts that that has for our air quality, especially for um, rural communities that are next to confined animal feeding operations uh, and are already suffering from respiratory diseases because of those confined animal feeding operations. And then of course, having the double impact of COVID affecting them as well. Um, and the kinds of pollutions that we're seeing go into our waterways, into our air, eroding our soil and more. Those are all decisions that um, people who hold office or who are sworn into office or um, hold political appointments have the power to make some decisions around those kinds of things. So what about during COVID-19, just in the last seven months? Um, what have we seen? Um, we've seen that this pandemic really is a portal to um, what, could be possible for our food systems. With this mass disruption of our economy and business as usual, we saw that we really had the opportunity to create resilient food systems and to really invest in the kinds of things on a community level that would allow folks to thrive. Um, unfortunately, what we saw instead is more of the same. We saw this, we have seen and we continue to see um, from the people that hold power that they're struggling to maintain the status quo of white supremacy and capitalism and corporate control and maintain business as usual, while communities on the ground are really trying to take care of each other and holding this ethos of community care. Um, for example, if we just look at what it is to work in the food system during this pandemic, this is a slightly outdated um, graphic, but what it shows is that there have been thousands and thousands of unnecessary um, cases of folks contracting COVID in the workplace. And one of the very big reasons for that is that one of those executive orders that came through came through about a month after the pandemic was declared on April 24th, the president issued an executive order to keep these meatpacking companies open and that exempting them from following any of the CDC guidelines around um, worker protection. So they have not had to comply with keeping six feet of space. They have not had to comply with providing personal protective equipment to workers. Um, and we still don't have any kind of OSHA regulation that makes it so that these companies have to comply with that or that there's any enforcement around that. Um, and what we saw is, it uh, came out later, that there are emails that these companies actually wrote um, that basically wrote the whole language the White House used for these executive orders. So we see that depending on who holds power and who they're accountable to makes a huge decision in terms of who we're voting for um, and why elections matter. We saw too that this could have been an amazing opportunity to really invest in um, creating farming opportunities for people who have been disenfranchised by the system who haven't had that same access to land and resources that we talked about through the Homestead Act and things like that, that it's an opportunity to really redirect federal funding. These are folks who are making decisions around where that funding goes towards creating community-based food systems led by BIPOC folks um, in the field. But instead, what we've seen from this administration is that farmers across the board, particularly small farmers, independent farmers have really just been left behind in the whole response. Um, from this administration. Um, so we know that we need something really, really different. <laughs> we know that um, we need uh, a Senate that is gonna fight for working people, for our families and for uh, the planet. We know that we need um, elected officials from, from school board to city council, to the state, to the federal government who are gonna really be accountable to our communities. And we often talk about the fact that um, these corporations that have this huge influence, they have the money, they're putting the money into 
making those decisions and regulating, we have the many, right? So it's up to us to organize and to turn out every single vote that we can. And we at HEAL think about this in terms of this three circles diagram, right? There's one set of ideas and ideology that really values profit. And that's what we've seen um, over time. We talked about the extraction of land and labor and life. Um, there's one ideology that holds that. That's the circle that's on the right around valuing profit profit. There is a whole other way of approaching our food and agriculture system, which is what we know Indigenous people here have had over time. Um, and we know that many of us are striving for is a system that values life. And what's in the middle of that, that third circle that we see in the overlap sphere is what's politically possible. And we know that everything that we want, the vision that we're working towards is not completely politically possible right now because of who holds power. But part of what we're doing when we're voting, when we're taking a step to um, get the right people elected who are accountable to our communities is starting to shift what's politically possible from a system that just values profit over land, labor, and life, and moving it towards one that actually values life and holds life as sacred. So at HEAL, we talk about our platform for real food and what we're working towards in terms of um, 10 basic planks that are around ensuring dignity for food workers and their families, um, providing opportunity for all producers, ensuring fair and competitive markets, strengthening regional economies and making them resilient, dumping junk food and the junk food marketing that goes along with that, making real food the norm in every neighborhood, increasing transparency around our food system so that everybody knows where their food is coming from. And of course, phasing out factory farming, promoting sustainable farming, fishing and ranching, and closing the loop on waste and runoff and energy. We believe that we can actually heal our economy and our health and our environment if we have people um, who are fighting for us at all levels of governance. And of course, our people fighting for that as well. And you can see from the things that I talked about historically, how each of these is affected by decisions that get made. We know that to change everything, it takes everyone, right? It's not just about um, those people who can vote. It's not just about a vote at all. Voting is just one tactic. We know that. It's uh, one tool that we can use to make the change that we need. Um, but it's a really, really important one. And um, as you're watching this, there are probably still some hours left before the polls close. So we need to make sure that we do everything that we can in order to turn out every single vote we can so that we have the kind of people in power who are gonna fight for our communities and fight for our planet and defend life over profit. Um, and of course, we wanna make sure that our folks are always taking political leadership where you can. So advocating for the kinds of policy changes that you wanna see, considering running for office yourself, and um, of course, holding all people who are appointed to any political office or sworn in uh, accountable to our communities. So really holding that political leadership. I will stop there and come back to you, Yona, with questions. Yay, thank you so much. I wish we could have a class of a couple hundred students clapping for you so that <laughs> we could really amplify the appreciation that I'm able to share with you over this Zoom call. Navina, thank you so much for such a thorough and thoughtful and, um, and uh, extensive sharing of the breadth of your knowledge. And obviously there's so much more to dig into. We've shared the, um, the platform for real food with students. We've encouraged them to go to your website to follow some of the campaigns that you're working on. And there's, um, I just have so much appreciation for what you've shared with us today. And uh, I have a couple of questions for you that I hope we still have time for. Um, and I, you know, as you were speaking, I was thinking, you know, where should I dig in? You're covering so many different topics and able to weave them together in such a comprehensive way. Um, and I wanted to start with a, a personal question, if that's okay, to ask what inspires you? What, what has inspired you and what kind of keeps you going especially as you work on this really systems-wide mm -hmm. perspective on change that is needed and envisioning change that is possible? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, for me, what, what really inspires and motivates me is watching the number of people who 
clearly care about their communities, who clearly care about their families and who are fighting for them in different ways. And that can look like um, as simple as um, cooking food for each other and making sure that each other are like nourished and fed um, or who are um, you know, fighting for policy or who are uh, working on different levels to retain or restore or reclaim traditional knowledge. Um, but the number of folks who I see really all over the country who are doing that kind of work and doing it in a way that's really about real relationships with each other and healing the relationships that we have with ourselves and with each other in the land. I feel, um, I feel like even as this pandemic, for example, has shown us how much politicians and corporations don't care about our communities, we're really seeing this other way of being that is like rooted in who we are as human beings. And it's like in our DNA to take care of each other. Um, the kind of mutual aid that's coming up, the ways that folks are fighting for each other really inspires me. That's, I think that's, um, that in and of itself inspires me. And I think that will continue to be inspiring for our students also as we kind of move into this next phase of, um, of American politics, you know, whatever whichever direction and directions we we go and to also feel empowered that we are able to impact that direction as you spoke mm -hmm. about so eloquently so thank you so much for that um and as i shared with you you know our students are being asked to create their to create and then share their own vision for a sustainable and specifically a resilient and equitable food system and so you know, you already spoke a lot about the the need for resilience and equity in the food system. And I wonder if you um, could just elaborate a little bit about how we as a society can get there and how individuals can contribute to that path, that mm. path ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think we can imagine a world where everybody has the right and the means to produce their own food or to procure their own food, to prepare it, to share it with each other. And what I mean by the right and the means is that it's, it's not just about access. It's not just about affordability. It's also about who, um, it's about being able to make decisions, right? It's about having community stewardship of land and air and water and resources that affect us all. Um, so right now it's really hard for any one of us to access food that's aligned with our values, right? It's really hard for any of us to um, do that in a way that isn't harmful to other living beings or um, harmful to ourselves in some way or a way that's culturally appropriate. But if we can imagine what it is that we all have that right and that means, it really shifts what we think about in terms of um, both private property and the the importance of being in community around how we care for all all of the things that sustain us um, and how we care for each other. Um, in terms of what folks can do to help us get there, I think um, you know there's 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 so many um, roles for folks to play, and there is a role for everyone to play in getting us there, right? So um, I think big part of that starts with us just understanding the ways that our whole system and our ways of thinking have been colonized, right? And how we're all in this Eurocentric idea of extraction of land and labor and life. Um, and really thinking about and addressing whether, whether you decide to do policy advocacy, whether you decide to run for office or whether it's just around, again, you know, making a meal for your community or whatever, but how can we keep doing all those things in ways that are decolonizing and dismantling those systems of capitalism, white supremacy and heteropatriarchy in ways that restore our relationships. Thank you so much for that. And I, I love that um, you talked about living in relationship and then have just shared with us all the different ways or so many of the different ways that that can happen, you know, from the small to the huge and, and each one of those can be significant. So I just want to thank you again so much, Navina, for 
sharing your wisdom, your experience, and also your inspiration, um, which is so important, especially at this time. One more plug to get out there and vote. While the get out there and vote open. and turn out every single vote you can. There are key states right now, just a few hours left to make sure that, you know, where there are meatpacking plants that are destroying our environments and people's health, um, where there are senators that have completely failed us that will not pass these regulations to protect workers. Um, and of course, where we can vote in an administration that will actually take care of us. There's so many ways to plug in and let's do it. That's when. Thank you so much, Navina. Thank, thank you to Heal Food Alliance as well. Thanks,